بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إننا صراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم وغير المغوب عليهم ولا المالين History of the Saints of the Golden Chain Number 11 Abdul Khalik al Rujdewani. The lights of some people precede their zikr, while the zikr of some people precede their lights. There is one who does loud zikr so that his heart be illumined, and there is one whose heart has been illumined, and he does silent zikr. Ibn Atahala Abdul Khalik al Rushdivani was known as the Sheikh of Miracles, one who shone like the sun. He was the master of the high stations of spirituality of his time. He was a perfect knower in Sufism and accomplished in asceticism. He is considered the fountainhead of the Naqshbandi Sufi order and the wellspring of the masters of Central Asia, Khwajagan. His father was Sheikh Abdul Jamil, one of the most famous scholars in Byzantine times in both external and internal knowledge. His mother was a princess, the daughter of the king of Seljuk Anatolia. Abdul Khalik was born in Gujdewan, a town near Bukhara in present-day Uzbekistan. There he lived and passed his life and was buried. He was a descendant of Imam Malik. In his childhood, he studied the Quran and its exegesis, the science of traditions, the sciences of the Arabic language, and jurisprudence with Sheikh Sadruddin. After mastering the divine law, he moved on to spiritual struggle until he reached a high station of purity. Then he moved to Damascus, where he established a school from which many students graduated. Each became a master of jurisprudence and the traditions, as well as spirituality, both in the regions of Central Asia, as well as in the Middle East. The author of the book al Hadaik al-Wardiya tells us how he reached his high station within the golden chain. He met Khidr and accompanied him. He took from him heavenly knowledge and added it to the spiritual knowledge he had obtained from his sheikh, Yusuf al-Hamadani. One day, when he was reading the Qur'an in the presence of Sheikh Sadruddin, he came upon the following verse, Call unto your sustainer humbly, and in the secrecy of your hearts. Verily, he loves not those who transgress the bounds of what is right. Qur'an, chapter 7, verse 55. This verse prompted him to inquire of Sheikh Sadruddin about the reality of silent zikr and its method. Abdul Khalik put his question thus. In loud zikr, you have to use your tongue. People might listen to you and see you. Whereas in the silent zikr of the heart, Satan might listen to you and hear you. Since the Prophet said in his holy tradition... Satan moves freely in the veins and arteries of the children of Adam. What then, O my Sheikh Sadruddin, is the reality of call in the secrecy of your hearts? His Sheikh replied, O my son, this is a hidden heavenly knowledge, and I wish that God exalted and almighty send you one of his saints to inspire on your tongue and in your heart, the reality of secret zikr. 
From that time, Sheikh Abdul Khalik al Gushdawani waited for that prayer to be fulfilled. One day, he met Khidr, who told him, Now, my son, I have permission from the Prophet to inspire on your tongue and in your heart the hidden zikr with its numbers. He ordered him to submerge himself under water and to begin making zikr in his heart. La ilaha illallah, Muhammadan Rasulullah. He did this form of zikr every day until the light of the divine, the wisdom of the divine, the love of the divine, and the attraction of the divine were opened to his heart. Because of those gifts, people began to be drawn to Abdul Khalik and sought to follow in his footsteps. He took them to follow in the footsteps of the Prophet. He was the first one in this honorable Sufi order to use the silent zikr. He was considered the master of that form of zikr. When his spiritual sheikh, Yusuf al Hamadani, the arch intercessor, came to Bukhara, he spent his time in serving him. He said about him, When I was twenty two years old, Sheikh Yusuf al Hamadani asked Khidr to continue raising me and to keep an eye on me until my death. Sheikh Muhammad Parsa, a friend and biographer of Shah Naqshband, said in his book Faslul Khitab that the method of Khwaja Abdul Khalik al Gushduwani in Zikr and the teachings of his eight principles were embraced and hailed by all forty Sufi orders as the way of truth and loyalty, the way of consciousness in following the Sunnah of the Prophet, by leaving innovation and by scrupulously opposing low desires. Because of that, he became the master of his time and the first in this line of spirituality. His reputation as an accomplished spiritual master became widespread. Visitors flocked to see him from every land. He gathered around him the loyal and sincere disciples for training and teaching. In this regard, he wrote a letter to his son, Al Kalb al Mubarak, Sheikh Awliya al Kabir, to specify the conduct of followers of this order. It says, O my son, I urge you to acquire knowledge and righteous conduct and the fear of God. Follow the steps of the pious early generation of Muslims. Hold fast to the Sunnah of the Prophet and keep company with sincere believers. Study jurisprudence, the traditions, and Quranic commentary. Avoid ignorant charlatans and maintain the prescribed prayers in congregation. Be aware of fame and its danger. Be among the ordinary people and do not seek positions. Do not enter into friendship with kings and their children, nor with innovators. Keep silent. Don't eat excessively and don't sleep excessively. Run away from people as you would run away from lions. Keep seclusion. Eat lawful food and leave doubtful actions except in dire necessity. Keep away from love of the lower world because it might fascinate you. Do not laugh too much because too much laughter will be the death of the heart. Do not humiliate anyone. Do not praise yourself. 
Do not argue with people. Do not ask anyone for anything except God. Do not ask anyone to serve you. Serve your sheikhs with your money and abilities. Do not criticize their actions. Anyone who criticizes them will not be safe because he does not understand them. Make your deeds sincere by intending them only for God. Pray to Him with humbleness. Make your business jurisprudence, your mosque your home, and your friend your Lord. The Principles of the Naqshbandi Way Abdul Khalik Augustawani coined the following phrases which are now considered the principles of the Naqshbandi Sufi order. Number 1. Conscious Breathing Conscious breathing, hosh dardam, means mind, hosh, and breath, dam. According to Abdul Khaliko Gushtuvani, it means The wise seeker must safeguard his breath from heedlessness coming in and going out, thereby keeping his heart always in the Divine Presence. He must revive his breath with worship and servitude and dispatch this worship to his Lord full of life. For every breath which is inhaled and exhaled with presence is alive and connected with divine presence. Every breath inhaled and exhaled with heedlessness is dead, disconnected from the divine presence. Ubaidullah al-Ahrar said, The most important mission for the seeker in this order is to safeguard his breath. And he who cannot safeguard his breath, it would be said of him, he lost himself. Shah Naqshaband said, This order is built on breath. So it is a must for everyone to safeguard his breath in the time of his inhalation and exhalation, and further, to safeguard his breath in the interval between the inhalation and exhalation. Sheikh Abul Janab Najmuddin al-Kubra said in his book Fawati al-Jamal, Zikr is flowing in the body of every single living creature by the necessity of their breath, even without will, as a sign of obedience which is part of their creation. Through their breathing, the sound of Hu of the divine name of God is made with every exhalation and inhalation, and it is a sign of the unseen essence serving to emphasize the uniqueness of God. Therefore it is necessary to be present with that breathing in order to realize the essence of the Creator. The name Allah, which encompasses the 99 names and attributes, consists of four letters, Alif, Lam, Lam, and the same H, Allah. The people of Sufism say that the absolute unseen essence of God, exalted and almighty, is expressed by the last letter vowelized by the Alif, Hu. The first Lam is for the sake of identification. The second Lam is for the sake of emphasis. Safeguarding your breath from heedlessness will lead you to complete presence. Complete presence will lead you to complete vision. Complete vision will lead you to complete manifestation of God's 99 names and attributes. God leads you to the manifestation of His 99 names and attributes and all His other attributes 
because it is said, Allah's attributes are as numerous as the breaths of human beings. It must be known by everyone that securing the breath from heedlessness is difficult for seekers. Therefore they must safeguard it by seeking forgiveness, because seeking forgiveness will purify it and sanctify it and prepare the seeker for the real manifestation of God everywhere. Number 2. Watch Your Step It means that the seeker, while walking, must keep his eyes on his feet. Wherever he is about to place his feet, his eyes must be there. He is not allowed to cast his glance here or there, to look right or left or in front of him, because unnecessary sights will veil the heart. Most veils on the heart are created by the images which are transmitted from your eyes to your mind during your daily living. These may disturb your heart with turbulence because of the different kinds of desire which have been imprinted on your mind. These images are like veils on the heart. They block the light of the Divine Presence. This is why Sufi saints do not allow their followers, who have purified their hearts through constant zikr, to look at other than their feet. Their hearts are like mirrors reflecting and receiving every image easily. This might distract them and bring impurities to their hearts, so the seeker is ordered to lower his gaze in order not to be assailed by the arrows of devils. Lowering the gaze is also a sign of humility. Proud and arrogant people never look at their feet. It is also an indication that one is following the footsteps of the Prophet, who, when he walked, never used to look right or left, but used to look only at his feet, moving steadfastly towards his destination. It is also the sign of a high state when the seeker looks nowhere except towards his Lord. Like one who intends to reach a destination quickly, so too the seeker of God's divine presence is single-minded, not looking to his right or his left, not looking at the desires of this world, but looking only for the divine presence. Imam al-Rabbani Ahmad al-Faruqi said, The gaze precedes the step and the step follows the gaze. The ascension to the high state is first by the vision, followed by the step. When the step reaches the level of the ascension of the gaze, then the gaze will be lifted up to another state, to which the step follows in turn. Then the gaze will be lifted even higher, and the step will follow in its turn. And so on until the gaze reaches a state of perfection to which it will pull the step. We say, when the step follows the gaze, the disciple has reached the state of readiness in approaching the footsteps of the Prophet, peace be upon him. So the footsteps of the Prophet are considered the origin of all steps. Shah Naqshaband said, If we look at the mistakes of our friends, we will be left friendless, because no one is perfect. Number 3. Journey Homeward The journey homeward means that the seeker travels from the world of creation to the world of the Creator. It is related that the Prophet said, 
I am going to my lord from one state to a better state and from one station to a higher station. It is said that the seeker must travel from the desire for forbidden to the desire for divine presence. The Nakshabandi Sufi order divides that travel into two categories. The first is external journeying and the second is internal journeying. External travel is to travel from one land to another searching for a perfect guide to take and direct you to your destination. This enables you to move to the second category, the internal journey. Seekers, once they have found a perfect guide, are forbidden to go on another external journey. In the external journey there are many difficulties which beginners cannot endure without falling into forbidden actions because they are weak in their worship. The second category, internal journeying, requires the seeker to leave his coarse manners, move to praiseworthy manners, and to throw out of his heart all worldly desires. He will be lifted from a state of impurity to a state of purity. At that time he will no longer be in need of more internal journeying. He will have cleansed his heart, making it pure like water, transparent like crystal, polished like a mirror, showing the realities of all matters essential for his daily life, without any need for external action on his part. In his heart will appear everything that is needed for his life and for the life of those around him. Number 4. Solitude in the Crowd Seclusion, khalwat, means to be outwardly with people while remaining inwardly with God. There are also two categories of seclusion. The first is external seclusion and the second is internal seclusion. External seclusion requires the seeker to seclude himself in a private place that is empty of people. Staying there by himself, he concentrates and meditates on zikr Allah, the remembrance of God, in order to reach a state in which the heavenly realm becomes manifest. When he chains the external senses, his internal senses will be free to reach the heavenly realm. This will bring him to the second category, internal seclusion. Internal seclusion means seclusion among people. Therein, the heart of the seeker must be present with his Lord and absent from the creations while remaining physically present among them. It is said, The seeker will be so deeply involved in the silent zikr in his heart that even if he enters a crowd of people, he will not hear their voices. The state of zikr overcomes him. The manifestation of divine presence envelops him, making him unaware of all but his Lord. This is the highest state of seclusion, and is considered true seclusion, as mentioned in the Holy Quran. People whom neither business nor profit distract from the recollection of God. Quran, chapter 24, verse 37. This is the way of the Nakshabandi order. The primary seclusion of the sheikhs of the Nakshabandi order is internal seclusion. They are with their Lord and simultaneously they are with the people. As the Prophet said, I have two sides, one faces my Creator and one faces creation. Shah Naqshaband emphasized the goodness of gatherings when he said, 
Our way is companionship, and goodness is in the gathering. It is said that the believer who can mingle with people and carry their difficulties is better than the believer who keeps away from people. On that delicate point, Imam Rabbani says, It must be known that the seeker at the beginning might use external seclusion to isolate himself from people, worshipping and concentrating on God, Almighty and Exalted, until he reaches a higher state. At that time he will be advised by his sheikh in the words of Sayyid al-Kharaz, Perfection is not in exhibitions of miraculous powers, but perfection is to sit among people, sell and buy, marry and have children, and yet never leave the presence of God even for one moment. Number 5. Essential Remembrance Abdul Khaliq's term was Yad Kard. Yad, remembrance, is dhikr, and kard is the doing of the dhikr. It is the doing of dhikr which is the essence or heart of remembrance. The seeker must recite the dhikr by negation and affirmation on his tongue until he reaches the state of the contemplation of his heart. That state will be achieved by reciting every day the negation La ilaha and affirmation Illallah on the tongue between 5,000 and 10,000 times, removing from his heart the elements that rust and tarnish it. This dhikr polishes the heart and takes the seeker into a state of manifestation. He must keep that daily zikr, either by the heart or by the tongue, repeating Allah, the name of God's essence which encompasses all other names and attributes, or by negation and affirmation through the saying of La ilaha illallah. This daily zikr will bring the seeker into the perfect presence of the one who is glorified. The dhikr by negation and affirmation in the manner of the Naqshbandi Sufi masters demands that the seeker close his eyes, close his mouth, clench his teeth, press his tongue to the roof of his mouth and hold his breath. He must recite the dhikr through the heart by negation and affirmation beginning with the word la, no. He lifts this la from under his navel up to his brain. Upon reaching his brain, the word la brings out the word illaha, God, moves from the brain to the left shoulder and hits the heart with illa except God. When that word hits the heart, its energy and heat spreads to all the parts of the body. The seeker, who has denied all that exists in this world with the words La ilaha, affirms with the words Illa that all that exists has been annihilated in the Divine Presence. The seeker repeats this with every breath, inhaling and exhaling, always making it come to the heart, according to the number of times prescribed to him by his sheikh. The seeker will eventually reach the state where in one breath he can repeat La ilaha illallah 23 times. A perfect sheikh can repeat La ilaha illallah an infinite number of times in every breath. The meaning of this practice is that the only goal is Allah and that there is no other goal for us. The understanding of the Divine Presence as the only existence awakens in the heart of the disciple the love of the Prophet. And at that time he says, Muhammad and Rasulullah, Muhammad is the Prophet of God, which is the heart of the Divine Presence.
Number six, returning. This is a state in which the seeker who recites zikr by negation and affirmation comes to understand the holy prophet's phrase, "O、oh、my God, you are my goal, and your good pleasure is my aim." The recitation of this phrase will increase in the seeker the awareness of the oneness of God, until he reaches a state in which the existence of all creation vanishes from his eyes. All that he sees, wherever he looks, is the absolute one. The Nakshabandi disciples recite this sort of zikr. In order to extract from their hearts the secret of oneness, and to open themselves to the reality of the unique divine presence, the beginner has no right to leave this thicker if he does not find its power appearing in his heart. He must keep on reciting it in imitation of his sheikh, because the prophet has said. Whoever imitates a group of people will belong to them, and whoever imitates his teacher will some day find this secret opened to his heart. The meaning of the word "returning," "bazgasht," is the return to God, exalted and almighty, by showing complete surrender and submission to His will. And complete humbleness in giving him all due praise. That is the reason the holy prophet mentioned in his invocation, "We did not remember you as you deserve to be remembered, O God." The seeker cannot come to the presence of God in his zikr, and cannot manifest the secrets and attributes of God in his zikr. If he does not recite zikr with God's support and with God's remembrance of Him, as Bayazid said, when I reached Him, I saw that His remembering of me preceded my remembrance of Him. The seeker cannot recite zikr by himself; he must recognize that God is the one reciting zikr through him. Number seven, attentiveness. Attentiveness means that the seeker must watch his heart and safeguard it by preventing bad thoughts from entering it. Bad inclinations keep the heart from joining with the divine. It is acknowledged in the Nakshabandi order that for a seeker to safeguard his heart from bad inclinations for fifteen minutes is a great achievement. For this, he would be considered a real Sufi. Sufism is the power to safeguard the heart from bad thoughts and to protect it from low inclinations. Whoever accomplishes these two goals will know his heart, and whoever knows his heart will know his Lord. The Holy Prophet has said, "Whoever knows himself knows his Lord." One Sufi sheikh said, "Because I safeguarded my heart for ten nights, my heart has safeguarded me for twenty years." Abu Bakr Al Kitani said, "I was the guard at the door of my heart for forty years, and I never opened it for anyone except God, Almighty and Exalted." Until my heart did not know anyone except God Almighty and Exalted. Abul Hasan Al Kharkani said, "It has been forty years that God has been looking at my heart and has seen no one except Himself, and there is no room in my heart for other than God." Number eight, recollection. Recollection refers to when the reciter of zikr safeguards his heart with negation and affirmation in every breath, without leaving the presence of God, Almighty and Exalted. 
It requires the seeker to keep his heart in God's divine presence continuously. This allows him to realize and manifest the light of the unique essence of God. He then casts away three of the four different forms of thoughts, egoistic thoughts, evil thoughts, and angelic thoughts, keeping and affirming solely the fourth form of thought, truthful thoughts. This will lead the seeker to the highest state of perfection by discarding all his imaginings and embracing only the reality which is the oneness of God, almighty and exalted. His Death and Succession Abdul Khalik al Gushduwani had four caliphs. The first was Sheikh Ahmed as Siddiq, originally from Bukhara. The second was Khabir al Awliya, the greatest of saints, Sheikh Arif Awliya al Kabir. Originally from Bukhara, he was a great scholar in both external and internal sciences. The third caliph was Sheikh Suleiman al Kirmani. The fourth caliph was Arif al Rewakri. It is to this fourth caliph that Abdul Khalik passed the secret of the golden chain before he died on the 12th of Rabiul Awal, 575 Hijra, 1179 current era.